Hello and welcome to this, the fifth of seven um, weekly lectures from the Centre for Academic English. My name is Mark Holloway and the focus of this lecture, ironically, is finding your voice with reporting language. So ironic that I am very much losing my voice right now. Um, Usually in a session like this, I would read quite a lot of the texts uh, that we're going to study. Um, but to protect my voice, I'm not going to do that. There'll be moments when I um, ask you to pause the video so that you can read. So please do that. I'll be giving you some tasks where you pause, read, um, answer a question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you some of my thoughts on those questions. But we're going to start um, by thinking back to the last lecture in this series where the focus was on academic integrity and specifically on plagiarism. And um, this week, uh, yeah, I wanted to start by looking at something that um, we can call patchwork plagiarism. And the materials I'm using here have been adapted from uh, a web page belonging to Northern um, Illinois University in the United States. Um, I'm actually going to use their materials for a purpose I think that they don't have in mind, but here we go. Um, so the Northern Illinois University have some academic integrity tutorials and among those tutorials, there is a um, an exploration of direct pa patchwork plagiarism. And it goes something like this. There are two sources here, one from Wikipedia, one from a book called Conflicts in Africa. Um, please pause the video so that you can read these two paragraphs. Okay. So far, so good. What we're going to see next is a text, a, a paragraph, which attempts to synthesize those two sources. So when I talk about synthesis, um, I'm talking about we might have two sources that we've read. We're going to try to bring them together into one piece of writing. When you when you write an essay, you might be write, using like 10, 15 sources and bringing them all together to try to answer a specific question um, that you're trying to answer. So here we go with these two sources. Let's see how they become one. Have a re you can pause, read and think about what problems we can see here. Okay. Hopefully, you immediately saw like one of the, the 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 first problem that I see here is hmm, if that's a synthesis of two sources, where are the references? There's no reference to um, what this writer has read. Even worse, however, if we compare the synthesized paragraph to the two original sources, and feel free to pause here and and have a close look. Um, on the left, I have highlighted some sentences in yellow. You can find these sentences in the synthesized paragraph. And hopefully it's become very clear to you straight away that this is a big problem. <clears throat> and the writer, presumably a student here, has taken um, sentences from sources, just copied and pasted them. The reason this is called patchwork is because they've gone okay from source A, put a sentence there, and then from source B, put a sentence there, and gone back to source A, a sentence there. Okay, so they haven't just taken a whole chunk of text and copied and pasted; they've been selective. Okay, now for some people that's the beginning of a journey um, in how to write from sources, but there's a problem here because. Uh, when we look at the um, the synthesis, I mean, it's not really a synth synthesis. 
There's no real work been done here by the writer. All they have done is copied and pasted. They're using other people's words and they're not saying where those words or ideas come from. So it's plagiarism, it's really bad practice, and it's a really kind of unhelpful piece of writing. At this point, I'm going to uh, politely disagree with Northern Illinois University because they suggest an improvement on the, the text in the box on the right is this new text in a box on the left. Please pause the video, have a read and consider ways in which this might be an improvement. Now, OK, we can see some areas of improvement here. Um, importantly, we see the introduction of references. So there's an indication that the information has come from somewhere else. They're not using um, a recognizable referencing format, but the information is there. And uh, the, the writer is no longer just copying and pasting. They're putting things into their own words. So instead of saying um, colonialism had a destabilizing effect that is still being felt in American politics, we've got the echoes of colonialism uh, can still be felt in today's global political sphere. Okay, Now they're doing what a typical textbook might tell you to do if you want to paraphrase. And they're kind of using synonyms, they're using grammatical structure, they're putting things into their own words. However, I would like to ask you a question. When, when you look at this uh, paragraph of paraphrased writing from two sources, where do you see evidence of the writer's own voice? Where do you see a contribution from the writer? Now, I'm using, I'm using the word writer here to refer to the person who wrote this text. When you hear me say the word author, I'll be talking about the, the, the people who wrote the original text. Okay, But where is the writer's voice in this? I would argue that the writer's voice is missing from this paragraph, it's completely absent. Because all the writer really did was copied and pasted, added some references and paraphrased. The sources aren't great. One of the sources is Wikipedia. I mean, I could change that Wikipedia entry right now. So I'm not sure how, how, how much we can trust Wikipedia as something worth citing and saying that's the source of my information. So personally, I don't think this is a, an example of good writing, partly because of the sources, but more importantly, all they have done is selected and paraphrased. And that's not really writing. That's not really answering a question. Um, all that shows is that they can manipulate a couple of sentences and they can be quite skillful with English. But I don't think it means that they can answer a question. And I think this, to me, tells us that paraphrasing is not enough. Paraphrasing is not the answer. Paraphrasing is not plagiarizing, but it's not necessarily good writing by itself. So I think we need to start again. Let's start again, and I'm going to take you back to uh, semester A and some classes from a short course I taught called Introduction to Academic Writing. If you attended these sessions or watched these videos separately, then I apologize for the repetition. But the points I want to make here are very important. <clears throat> Our starting point is this. People who write Academic texts, people who work at universities, people who study at universities, people who do research, form communities. And academic communities care about a, 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 some things. 
academic communities have certain values. They care about knowledge, understanding, research, analysis, complexity, not simplicity, and respect. Maybe simplicity of communication, but complexity of, of thought and ideas. We don't care about like simple questions with simple answers. We want to ask difficult questions with complicated and interesting answers. And notice that some of those words there, knowledge, understanding, research, analysis, are all words that you will see in marking criteria and they'll be associated with like higher grades in writing. You need to demonstrate knowledge, you need to demonstrate understanding, you need to show your research, you need to demonstrate your ability to analyze. We don't always use the, we don't often use the word respect in marking criteria, but um, for me, respect is an important part of academic style. The fact that academic communities value these things leads to the, what I would say are the three most important features of academic writing. The academic writing needs to be precise needs to be concise and it needs to be respectful respectful because it's writing for a community um, precise because that community is interested in precision and detail and knowledge and understanding and it needs to be concise because partly because of the respect we show to one another um, we have limited time we have limited resources and typically our publications and our essays have a have a word limit so we need to write as much as, put as much detail as we can into a short or a limited number of words. So academic writing is done by and for academic communities and academic writing needs to be precise, concise and respectful. Um, for that reason, <clears throat> um, I'm quite a big fan of a, a book that's very popular in the United States, um, which is called They Say, I Say, The Moves That Matter in Academic Writing uh, by Gerald Graff and Kathy Birkenstein. Now, in this book, Graff and Birkenstein are very clear about the fact that academic writing is for an academic community or it's, it's a it's it's a it's something that we it's a form of communication that we do with an audience and academic writing is for graf and birkenstein like a conversation and when we read we our writing becomes a response to what we've read and typically our responses to what we read can be reduced to kind of three simple pathways one is we might disagree, one is we might agree, and one is we might say, yes, but like we agree with part of that, but not all of it. Okay, or we agree with this, but we think we can go further. So that's the starting point for the rest of this session. Um, and if we start thinking about academic writing as a conversation within a community, hopefully you start to see the importance of having a voice and not just copying and pasting and then paraphrasing uh, what other people say. To illustrate this, I'd like to introduce you to uh, a writer who I think is rather good. So um, the image on uh, <laughs> the image in, in the middle now, the, the, the left hand side image uh, is a guy called John Sutherland, who is uh, or was a professor of um, English literature. Uh, the image on the right is the cover of a book um, he authored called, well, it's called John Sutherland, The Literary Detective, and it contains a um, hundred essays that he wrote trying to solve puzzles in classic English fiction. So there's a kind of uh, an obvious image there of Sherlock Holmes, who is a detective from literature. John Sutherland is an academic, a literary critic, who looks at literature closely and tries to analyse it in a way that will answer interesting questions. And I'm going to show you um, 
uh, a couple of extracts from an essay he wrote about uh, a novel whose title character is depicted here. Okay, so this is this, actor, this is an actor called Bella Lugosi, um, and I think this is a kind of classic image of this particular literary character um, taken from a film adaptation of a late 19th century novel and I think you probably recognize that character. I hope you all know that this is Dracula and that Dracula is a vampire and in my experience as a teacher um, I think people generally are interested in vampires. I'm really sorry if you're not. Um, but yeah, I, whenever I talk about vampires to a class, they can tell me lots of things about vampires, like uh, how you kill them, <laughs> how they avoid being killed, uh, how they, or what they eat, and, and so on. Um, so I hope you can relate to the short extract that I'm going to show you. Um, the extract comes from an essay uh, which asks the question, why does the Count come to England? Because uh, you may or may not know that um, uh, Dracula is an English novel, although Dracula is from Transylvania in modern day Romania. Uh, the novel is English and the, the story of the novel Dracula involves Count Dracula moving to um, England and trying to settle in England. And John Sutherland asked the question, well, why England? Why does he come to England? Why doesn't he go to any other country? You know, when, when was it? 1897. Um, I'm, spoiler alert, but I'm going to tell you his answer. <laughs> So John Sutherland um, argues that the reason the Count comes to England is because at the time, England is the most um, modernised uh, country and culture in the world. And that the Count Dracula has this long history and lineage um, in Eastern Europe, but he needs to kind of move with the modern world and he needs to embrace modernity. So yeah, John Sutherland's interpretation of the whole novel is that um, Dracula has to, in order to survive and for his own future, he chooses to come to England to become modern and to become part of the modern world. Okay, and you'll, you'll see some explanation of that later. Um, a quick detour right now, because I'm telling you about something that I've read, so I should give you a reference to it. So, um, actually, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to make my, my, uh, my slides invisible for a moment, and just ask you if, if I want to share information with you about an article that I've read, or an, uh, in this case, um, an essay that I've read, what details do I need to tell you about it? You can pause the video now and make a note of like, okay, what information needs to go into a reference? And hopefully this will answer your questions. I'm gonna tell you who wrote the essay. I've already said his name is John Sutherland. I'll give you the title of the essay, which is Why Does the Count Come to England? I'll give you the book in which the essay appears, and the book is called Is Heathcliff? Is Heathcliff a Murderer? Um, I'll tell you who published this text, like who made it available in the first place for me to buy or to find in the library, and the publisher is called Oxford University Press. I'll tell you when they did this, when it was published. It was published in 1996. And I'm also giving you the pages, 233 to 238, so that with this information, you could go to the library right now, or you could go to a bookshop, you could go to Amazon, you could Google this, and you, this will lead you to the same 
version of the book that I am referring to. So if you want to read it for yourself in full, you can. Now that is the basic, and that's the fundamental um, reason for referencing, to show what I've read, where it comes from, and particularly where you can find it. So if, whenever you're writing and, and, and referencing your reading, you need to be telling your reader how they can find a particular text for themselves. And the way we do that is to provide these details. We don't, I'm, I'm not giving you um, uh, uh, a code that you can use in the library at the University of Hertfordshire because you might, very unlikely, but you might go on a holiday next week. You might go and visit a friend at another university. You might be using a library somewhere else in the world, but you still want to find this book. With this information, it will be the same wherever you go. Okay. The order in which we present this information in our references depends on our subject area and the conventions of that field. Um, but I am presenting here um, an author date system, which means that I give you the author's surname and then I put the year of publication in brackets. And in my full reference, I'll also add their first initial. I give the smaller text first and then the bigger text second. So in this case, the smaller text is a chapter. The bigger text is a book. It might be that you're referring to a, um, a an article, like a research piece that appears in a journal. So you put the title of the article first, the title of the journal second. If it's a newspaper article, name of the article first, name of the newspaper second. If it's a web page, name of the title of the particular page first, title of the website second. Okay. Um, and because this is a book, I'm giving you the name of the publisher afterwards. So I hope what you can see is I'm giving you some specific information, name of the author, and then I'm giving you like the bigger information. Well, the title of the text, where it appears, who published it. In some referencing systems, you also have to say where it was published because Oxford University Press might have um, uh, might have places around uh, different places around the world where 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 they publish. So it might be in Oxford, it might be in New York. Okay, and the reason I'm including page numbers here is just out of kindness to you. You'll be you'll be able to find it really easily. So it's almost like I'm doing what I've done in real life, and I've put a little bookmark um, in in the book for you, so you can find it easily. We, we, that's, we're all about that. Now, very quickly. <clears throat> two, um, two, two points relating to um, critical thinking about text. I think I should probably disclose at this point, but we're seeing in these books. See, there's a there's a photo of an actor there called Laurence Olivier. There's a there's a there's a photo of an actor playing Sherlock Holmes here. There seems to be a series of books uh, published by. Um, Oxford University Press using images from films. And this is because um, in the 1990s, um, Oxford were trying to kind of revitalize the classics. They were trying to uh, sell copies of books and they were exploiting kind of the, a, a bit of a trend in the 1990s for filmmakers to return to classic literature and, and create new um, film adaptations of um, of classic uh, texts, classic books. So that includes Dracula, it includes uh, Frankenstein, it includes um, some Jane Austen novels too. Um, and there's a kind of, there, there is a, there's always a financial angle to, to anything that we read. Um, someone has to pay for it, someone has to make things happen. And so uh, Oxford University Press were using imagery from films to kind of sell books and to relaunch these books. They called them you know, World's Classics, nice design for the cover, as you'll see. Um, and someone like John Sutherland was useful to them because he was an academic who was interested in asking questions, interesting questions about classical literature. 
Um, and of course, by publishing books of his essays, they were also kind of encouraging people to reread the original texts and therefore hopefully to buy their books. OK, so that's how kind of when I say critical thinking, I'm talking about understanding that books and texts don't just appear from nowhere. They, they relate to one another. They relate to the world. They relate to politics, culture and economics. And for us to understand those connections is, is what it means to be critical, or critically aware, at least. And another point on, on, on that. Um, so here you go. Here is the, uh, the Oxford World's classic um, edition of Bram Stoker's Dracula from 1897. So this was a version of the you know, uh, uh, just packaging uh, from the 1990s, but the text is from the 1890s. When John Sutherland writes about Dracula, the, the book, Dracula, the original book, is a primary source. A primary source is a text or some data that we analyze directly and interpret directly. So it's the kind of the, the subject of our study. But of, of course, a lot of the things that we read in universe, uh, university are books about our subject. They're not the subject itself. We call these kind of texts secondary sources. So in John Sutherland's um, essay, I'm going to show you an extract in a moment. He refers to a book uh, called Vampires, Burials and Death by Paul Barber. This is an example of a secondary source. This is a book about vampires and John Sutherland is going to use it to inform his own uh, analysis and discussion of his primary source, which is Dracula. And when you're uh, writing essays, you might be going to some data, you might be using a case study, you might be reflecting on a patient you've worked with or a client that you've worked with. That's your primary source. There might be data you've collected yourself that's numerical or even text-based from interviews. This is all primary data. These are your primary sources. But theory that you read that helps you to interpret them, those are secondary sources. Okay. So let's see how John Sutherland um, puts together his... Um, his reading of the primary source and the secondary source and his anal analysis of everything um, in, in, in his own work. So remember, he's trying to answer the question, why does the Count come to England? And ultimately his answer is, the Count comes to England in order to become modern and to become part of the modern world. To protect my voice, I'm not going to read this aloud. So please do pause the video now and read these two paragraphs um, this text is available to you as a, as a as a pdf as well along with some other materials for, from later in the lecture so feel free to use that if it's easier to read from there but pause these are the first two paragraphs of the essay And now that you have read these two paragraphs, we're going to move forward. We're going to jump forward two pages in um, John Sutherland's essay. So we're moving from page 233 to page 235. And hopefully you'll see something different going on in this paragraph. So take your time to read it. Compare it with the previous two paragraphs you've read and consider what um, John Sutherland includes in this paragraph and what he's doing with this paragraph. Okay, so let's analyze this together. I'd like to show you how I think we can trace John Sutherland's voice in these three paragraphs. Now, Hopefully you've noticed that John Sutherland is referring to his primary source. He's referring to details from Dracula. But he's also referring to 
other information that he's either getting from like the world and he's, he's going to talk about how um, there's some kind of industry making money from vampires and vampire stories um, and that there's an expert called Barber who has done research into the, the kind of origins the, the 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 diversity of myths about vampires and also the origins of those myths so he's got these kind of like details this information these uh, analyses and he has to put them together and he has to show how they're linked together and how they help answer the question and that part is his own voice so he's um last week when i was talking about plagiarism I talked about this uh, metaphor that if um, when you're writing an essay, it's a little bit like going to the supermarket and buying ingredients so that you can make a pie. And you don't grow the ingredients, you choose the ingredients, you prepare the ingredients in some way and you assemble them in a way that you can then serve to your friends or your family and say, I made this for you. And that's very different to going to the shop and just buying a pie. And then lying to your friends and family and saying, hey, I made this for you when you know that you didn't. Okay. The ingredients are like details from um, the, the original novel here and uh, observations about the, 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 the place of vampires in the world and also um, analysis and understanding that John Sutherland has gained from reading secondary sources like Barb. Now, if I look at this, you'll see that I have highlighted different parts of the text in three different colours. One of the colours represents Sutherland's voice. One of the colours represents the analysis of another author. And one of the colours... Uh, it indicates um, details and information that um, it's not really an it's not really interpretation it, it's just being presented possibly in support of a point or as explanation for a point you can take a, a moment if you like to try to work out which what, what each color here represents And of course, I'll tell you that the, the cyan, the kind of light blue color, that's Sutherland's voice. He starts off by saying, we're obsessed with vampires. Okay. And then he makes a, a comparison. The, the, next, the next contribution from him is he compares um, the vampire industry to Dracula himself. Like when you think, he, you think he's dead, but then he comes back to life. Then we see him, um, the, the next contribution is an evaluation of Paul Barber, where he calls Paul Barber's work essential. And next, he says, he describes it as convincing. He manages to highlight points just with the word particularly. And he, he shows his agreement with Barber by saying Barber shows that th this, the this highlighted text in, in, in science, that's um, Sutherland's voice. That's him being the architect of his writing. The yellow, the, the details. <clears throat> and the details come from his observations. They come from facts about cinema. They come from facts that, that he has found reported by Paul Barber. Okay? But I hope you notice there's a difference between the yellow and the green. The green represents the analysis and the interpretation of Paul Barber. OK, so Paul Barber um, is the person who says that not only us, it's not important that it's not only important that superstitions can be found everywhere, but it's more important to, to notice that they come from um, our concern about what happens to us after we die. It's basically the point there, right? So that's 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 not a fact, is it? That's an interpretation. Last week, in last week's um, lecture, 
I spoke about the difference between like, common knowledge and something that we need to reference. Okay, this is definitely not common knowledge. This is definitely Paul Barber's contribution. So I highlighted highlighted that in green. And if we go to the to my next slide, you'll see. Again, it, very early in the paragraph, it's Sutherland's voice explaining that uh, for him, the key to reading Dracula is to understand or is to notice that there are many, many references to modern technology. And remember, John Sutherland wants to show us that Count Dracula came to England in order to embrace the modern world. So the point he's making is that the novel is full of references to the modern world in relation to like technology, like typewriting, which was new at the time, um, uh, blood transfusion, so like the technology uh, developments in medicine. The details in yellow all come from the uh, the novel, so they all come from the primary source. It's important, I think, that John Sutherland is observing these details and bringing them together. But they don't come from him. Yeah. They come from the original novel. He's just kind of summarizing details and, and, and pointing them out. It's the parts in, in blue that really give us um, Sutherland's voice and his message. And I've even included the, the part where, um, if, you, if you're familiar with the Dracula story, Van Helsing is kind of like um, the person who's going to defeat the uh, vampire. And... This sentence at the end, Van Helsing even developed an early version of radar. It's very much interpretation and it's becoming a little bit creative. So that's why I kind of highlighted that in blue. Now, I hope you agree with me that John Sutherland writes well. And I hope you agree with me that it's very clear what John Sutherland's um, contribution to this topic is. Um, and how he's using the information available to him. Very different to that first example where someone was just copying and pasting and then where someone else was copying and pasting and then paraphrasing. This is much more, uh, much more advanced writing which aims to answer a question. But what can we learn from that and how can we find our voice? Um, I think we can find our voice by bearing in mind those things, okay? Like, Okay, when I was reading this, what of the detail? Which of the details were just uh, were observations and that, that are out there in the world? Of what I'm reading, what is the analysis and contribution of the the, the writer, um, and what is the contribution and analysis of other authors that the writer refers to? And I just want to do a very simple um, exercise to 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 show you what I mean by that. So. Six sentences here. I wrote these six sentences. Um, five, number five and six are, are kind of like different versions of each other. But I think if I follow advice that I should um, paraphrase what I find in my reading and I should reference that, then I'm doing a good job. Okay, So I have paraphrased and referenced um, six details, well, five details from the text, and here are six six sentences that communicate that. Please pause, read the sentences carefully, and consider whether you think there's anything odd about this. And maybe that wasn't an easy question to answer. What is odd about this? So, if we go back to the point I made before, sometimes the texts that we read are making a, like a contribution, an argument. Sometimes they're stating facts and sometimes they are referring to other writers. Okay. If that's the case, then should we really treat everything in the same way and just like paraphrase it and put a reference? I would argue if we do that, it, it shows a limited understanding of what we've read. And I would suggest that we can improve these six sentences like this. Feel free to pause and read them. But I'll go through 
one by one why I think these sentences are improved. So number one, I'm going to move backwards and forwards between the slides. Number one, I referenced Sutherland while stating actually a fact, a straightforward fact that there was a film directed by Francis Ford Coppola that was released in 1993. That information does not originate with with um, John Sutherland. So I don't need to reference that. That's common knowledge. What I do need to do, however, and you remember the um, they say, I say, you know, here's what I read. And so, or but, and yeah, I agree with it, but. If we are making this point that a film was directed and released in 1993, we should then go on to say why it's significant. Why are we giving, you know, if we are presenting some fact, we need to tell our readers why. So the film was released in 1993, and this is significant because it represents a trend of um, uh, filmmakers revisiting classic literature in order to create um, new films. Or actually the point that um, Sutherland is making is it's significant because Francis Ford Coppola is a big name in cinema in the same way that Tom Cruise is a big name in popular culture. So it helps us make the point that this topic is important because these these big figures in our culture um, are, are paying attention. My second sentence I haven't changed because I think it's a statement of fact. The human fascination with vampires has been exploited by a range of money-making activities. I'm presenting that as a fact. I'm not disagreeing with it, but I should probably go on to say, so what? Yeah? Why is this important? Okay. Which I think is something that Sutherland does. Number three and four, please note that I attributed points three and four to Sutherland. And that, sh that would show that I didn't really understand the text. And that's one of the problems with just copying, pasting, paraphrasing. I've missed something here. I've missed the fact that Sutherland is not the person who's making these points. He is reporting that pa Barber made these points. And I've um, changed it. I should say at this point, as a good student, I now go and check Barber for myself and check that he's really written this. OK, um, if you're interested and you don't have time to do this, you would say Barber 1990 comma cited in Sutherland comma 1996, was it? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I need to show that um, this was what Barber did and what Barber uh, suggested and notice my choice of reporting language and I've highlighted this in blue because this is my contribution here Barber found that I'm showing with this sentence that Barber did some research and uncovered a commonality in beliefs relating to vampires around the world in different cultures in sentence number four I've chosen suggest because this is um, this is not just a statement of fact. This is not what Barber did. It's what Barber argued. He, this is his interpretation of his data. So I want a verb to reflect that. When it comes to five and six, I've written these two uh, separately, partly because I just want to show you that there are no right or wrong ways to do this. Well, <laughs> not entirely. Um, that what you write is a way of showing your understanding and your perspective on what you've read. So in number five, I want to show that Sutherland is the originator of this idea that techn technological developments in late Victorian England are important and common. I've got these words, important, okay? Important is a judgment. So I want to make sure that I'm, I'm showing my reader honestly, I might, 
It's not my original judgment, it's Sutherland's judgment. But I also want to show that I agree with that judgment. I think it's a good judgment. The way I do that is I choose the word point out. I could use the word show and it would be the same. Sutherland points out that this is important. It's saying, he says this and I agree. Okay. If I didn't want to agree, I could say something like Sutherland claims that and then I can argue against it later. Or according to Sutherland, you know, that's nice and neutral. And I'll, I'll give you more on this later. Okay. Um, in the final sentence, um, I'm not using the word important. I've taken out the judgment. So uh, the novel Dracula makes numerous references to late Victorian technological and social developments. Now, I think, you know, this is true. It does. But it's Sutherland who's pointed it out. So by by taking the name Sutherland out of my sentence here, I'm kind of establishing now I accept this as a fact and I'm just showing you uh, where it comes from. But I think I should also also go further and add my own interpretation or argument to that, which is why I'm suggesting that we could continue with the words this suggests. So what I'm trying to show here is that it's with language and just simple things like uh, Barber found that, Barber suggests that, Sutherland points out that, that we can start to show our own voice in relation to what we've read. We can show we've understood it, but we could also show what we think about it. We can show the the points that we're accepting, the points that we are, are recognizing as arguments that we agree with, or the things that we are treating as fact and we want to do something else with. Okay, So far, you know, we've not looked at anything that we particularly disagree with. So, yeah, that's that's the way forward. So what I'm suggesting is that by using reporting language here, I'm able to show something of my voice. And I hope you agree that I'm doing much more than just paraphrasing and showing I read this and you know this is what this person says and this is what this person says and this is what this person says. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm showing my response to what I've read in a way that would help me put these details together and answer a question that I want to answer. Okay. So something for you to think about. <clears throat> Dracula comes to England because he needs to embrace modernity, brackets, Sutherland 1996. In some ways, I think a sentence like this is a little bit odd because this is the main point of Sutherland's essay. This is his thesis, his thesis statement. This is his argument. Okay. I put it in my words. Um, but I'm presenting this as if it's an accepted fact. And I think it makes more sense to put it in a frame like this. Sutherland, 1996, then have a verb and then to write Dracula. Dracula comes to England because he needs to embrace modernity. My challenge for you is to pause the video now and think of a word that could go in that box in the middle. Hopefully you paused, you had a think. My suggestion would be concludes, because that is the conclusion of Sutherland's essay. You could also use something like argues. He argues that Dracula comes to England because he needs to embrace modernity, or he concludes that Dracula comes to England because he needs to embrace modernity. If you 100% agree with Sutherland and you want to show that agreement, you could say Sutherland shows that Dracula comes to England because he needs to embrace modernity. But please note that these verbs have very specific different meanings. A conclusion is different to an argument and uh, someone pointing something out is different to say someone proving. And I would be worried if you were saying Sutherland proves that Dracula comes to, because ultimately it's an interpretation and it's not um, it's not a scientific uh, experiment that can demonstrate 100% one way or another whether something is true or not. Okay, so what to take away from this? Always consider the content of what you're reporting or what you're referring to, what you're responding to. And notice that we don't just refer, we report, we respond. And consider whether the content is, is it common knowledge? 
uh, like Francis Ford Coppola uh, directed um, Bram Stoker's Va Dracula, the film in 1993. If it's common knowledge, then no citation is needed. You don't need to reference it. Is it a statement that you accept as fact? In which case you could just present it as such with a, with a reference in brackets. You could use a, a reporting verb like states, Sutherland states that, or even Sutherland shows that. Is it a demonstration that something is true? In which case points out, shows would be perfect. Is it a statement that you are neutral about or skeptical of? In which case, you choose a verb that re that reflects that. You don't use show. You might say suggests. You might say claims. Now, <clears throat> next two words on my list is, is it a claim? The next three words. Is it a claim? Is it an unsubstantiated claim? Is it an argument? <clears throat> and I'd just like to explain something here. That um, So an unsubstantiated claim is when someone... Uh, says that something is so, and tries to explain something, or says that something is 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 true, um, but has done nothing to demonstrate that that is the case. hasn't provided any evidence, any explanation, any detail. Okay, so I was uh, there, there were t terrible things going on when, uh, like in two thousand and sixteen, it wasn't a great year. Two thousand and sixteen. In 2016, uh, when Donald Trump became uh, president of the United States, uh, he was running against uh, Hillary Clinton. And there were ridiculous claims made about Hillary Clinton by right wingers and conspiracy theorists in the United States. Um, and the claim was that Hillary Clinton um, kind of ran a huge organization which uh, basically enslaved children for paedophiles and held them in a dungeon underneath a pizza restaurant in uh, Washington and uh, Washington DC. And that clients could order different things, different horrendous things by uh, using the pizza menu. Like I want a margarita means one thing and I want a pepperoni means something else. Um, a lot of people believed that claim. A lot of people spread that claim. Uh, Fox News, I think, um, were quite keen on that claim. Um, someone went into the pizza shop with a gun because they believed that claim. But there, it was, of course, an unsubstantiated claim. There was absolutely no evidence to support it. And it was an absolutely ridiculous thing. Now, in sadly, in the world we live in, we often have to treat information we receive with an element of distrust. There's a lot of misinformation and fake news about. So we have to recognize that in the world, we often meet unsubstantiated claims. If you're given something to read from a reading list uh, as a university student, it's probably not got unsubstantiated claims in it. There might be uh, claims made with um, evidence that you dispute or you don't think is completely persuasive, but it's very rare to find genuinely unsubstantiated claims in academic writing. Possibly when you know students sometimes get criticised for, for making unsubstantiated claims. And it's one of the reasons why some people say, oh, don't use I in academic writing. It's just because they think that if you use I, you're, gonna, you're more likely to just say, I think this and not explain it. I don't think that I have trust in all students and you're smarter than that. So, um, yeah, it's important to know that uh, when when we talk about claims in uh, one of the reasons why the word claim is quite neutral is because a claim by itself, um, it you know, is 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 like a statement without the support. Usually when we meet claims in academic texts, they are followed by support or elaboration. And when we put that together, that becomes an argument. So there is a relationship between um, claim and argue. An argument is like a claim with, with the details. That's how I see it anyway. Okay. Now, if it's a claim, you can refer to it as a claim. If it's an argument, you can refer to it as an argument. Okay. If someone is making a drawing a conclusion, you can refer to it as a conclusion. You can use the verb conclude. If it's a belief, you can use the verb believe. If it's a suggestion, you can say suggest. Okay. 
Now, um, I would urge you to think also about your subject area. And when you're reading for your field, you may not see all of these things. In some subject areas, like the value of a belief might be so so um, unimportant that we don't we don't ever see it. It might not be you know beliefs might not be valued in the way that um, uh, evidence is. So a subject like um, philosophy, you'll see the word belief come up in philosophy. But you might not see the word belief in um, in medicine, but in the history of medicine, you probably would. So just just bear in mind that um, conclusions are fairly common features of all texts that we read, but beliefs, claims, statements that we might be skeptical of, then we might not find them in in all texts, um, and it's exploring and deciding. Uh, what what we see that is important here. <clears throat> okay, so for the for the for the rest of this um, uh, video, I'm just going to speak a little bit about how you can you can develop your own repertoire of reporting language because obviously it's it's really important for us to be able to recognise when a writer is stating something, when a writer is um, uh, arguing something when when a claim is being made and so on, um, but it's uh, it's a slightly different thing to to make decisions about what what language is uh, useful to you and what language you'll typically find in your field. Um, so I just want to talk briefly about um, uh, a really important article within kind of this field from the end of the 20th century. So um, Ken Highland, writing in 1999, did a study on the use of citation and the construction of disciplinary knowledge. And this study, which involved uh, looking at, at texts um, in a range of different disciplines and considering the ways that authors in those, in those um, subject areas used citations um, and what kind of language they used and how um, this represented the way that they uh, uh, they they become part of of a, a kind of a respected member of their uh, of, of of their of their field or of the community of their field um, and the study um, we we can we can well Highland drew various conclusions from from his study some of the things that they noticed that uh, we could we can compare like arts and humanities with sciences and kind of probably draw a, a kind of spectrum from like hard sciences to softer sciences social sciences humanities arts and find generally there's a kind of continuum um where uh, writers in humanities and social sciences typically use more citations than writers in hard sciences. Humanities and social science writers are more likely to use integral structures. I'll come to that in a moment, but it's when um, they're referring to an author and using the author's name in their sentences and not just in brackets or in the footnotes. Um, and that writers in humanities and social sciences were more likely to use reporting verbs. So remember what I said earlier about academic communities. Highland's text is basically uh, supporting that idea that academic communities um, communicate in particular ways with one another um, in that we can recognise and we can see that the way they communicate reveals something about the way they display and build their, 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 their knowledge and uh, status. So Highland says that the construction of academic facts is a social process with a cachet of acceptance only bestowed on a claim after negotiation with editors, expert reviewers and journal readers. The final ratification granted with the citation of the claim by others and eventually the disappearance of all acknowledgement as it is incorporated into the literature of the discipline. So what he finds is that actually our knowledge um, 
comes into existence through academic texts. And when we accept and start citing, um, when we accept the points of others and start um, uh, citing them uh, and proliferating ideas in that way, that knowledge spreads and it eventually over time, facts become those those deep, those those claims become facts and they become accepted and we sometimes get to the point where we don't need to reference them anymore um <clears throat> so yeah just an example of uh one of the figures from highland's essay uh, article sorry um basically ranking subject areas in terms of the numbers of the kind of quantity of citations per 100 words and what you see is like sociology has more citations than marketing which has more citations than philosophy and so on and so on down to like if you're an engineering or physics student you might notice that you know there are fewer uh, citations used and therefore kind of required in your field and Highland makes this distinction that I've referred to um, between integral and non-integral citations really simple that um, an integral citation uses the author's name as like the subject or the object of a sentence. So here's an example. Cursed Air 2009 points out that. So if there's an integral citation, typically we see reporting language. If there's a non-integral citation, the, this means that the, the author's name comes in brackets at the end of the sentence and is not part of the sentence. I've shown you a few examples of this already. In... Um, in some of the hard sciences or in, in, in subjects where uh, like a numerical um, reference system, system is used, this is obviously, we don't even see the author's name in brackets. We just see a number at the end of a line. And yeah, so breaking down by subject, Highland is able to show uh, which subject areas have like more integral or non-integral uh, citations. So in biology, for example, it's not so common to use the author's name. Um, and in the in in the examples where uh, an author's name is given, it's kind of like almost 50 50 as whether it's the subject or not. So that's more of a kind of linguistic analysis. So what reporting language is used in your field? Well, Highlands um, study can help us to an extent. <clears throat> because what he did here, is he um, analyzed text and found that certain reporting language was more common in some fields than others. So do feel free to pause the video now and have a look at the um, verbs on the screen. The, so say, suggest, argue, claim, point out, propose, think, what subject area do they come from? Um, and so on and so on. I can reveal. Uh, the subject as follows so notice like actually verbs like say and think are not very common in any other um, subject areas other than philosophy uh, there are you know we, we see we see some verbs common across subject areas so philosophy sociology applied linguistics marketing um, biology and uh, all feature quite kind of common use of the verb suggest but only philosophy has say um, i think only physics has study physics and mechanical engineering have report and, and so on um, and of course i'm only showing you the the subjects that highland studied here so we've only got seven <clears throat> so that you could start applying this to your own knowledge and your own um, subject area it might be helpful to think of um, what categories of reporting verbs we have so highland um, comes up with three categories uh, really i mean, you could call these two but there are yeah what he calls factive and non-factive and acts so starting with factive Factive verbs are the ones that express the writer's attitude or position. So that's if you use if you use these verbs, it shows what you think. 
So I've already given the example earlier about how point out, if I use Sutherland points out that it shows that I agree. Less common, but if I was to say uh, Sutherland overlooks and so on, I, I'm kind of like, that's that's a way of criticizing, that's, that's showing my position, but in a way that's um, critical of the author. What we see though is far more verbs uh, or a wider variety of verbs are used to try to express the author's attitude or position, as we've seen. And they might show that the author is critical or the, the author is neutral or tentative or positive. Um, examples are here. Again, these are available um, uh, on the, the PDF that accompanies this uh, video. And finally, there are verbs that uh, describe um, like actions, not not just for reporting what's been said. So notice that these do not report. We um, we can say Sutherland points out that, um, but we we don't say Sutherland explores that. We say Sutherland, Sutherland explores the question of why the count came to England. Okay, so highland divides acts into acts of like thinking acts of discussion that's cognition and discourse uh, procedures and uh, specific research acts and again you might want to pause and look at this in more detail but yeah highland study breaks these down by subject area and considers the the, the, the various um not just the specific verbs that are used, but the type of the category of, of reporting language that is used in different fields. Um, and also very important is for you to know the patterns of use with each of these verbs. So I'm referring here to a lovely book called, um, for applied linguists, but I think it's relevant to everyone <clears throat> from uh, Hunston, uh, Susan Hunston, and David Oakey, uh, published back in 2010. They have a lovely chapter about reporting language and I think this table, which I've included in the handout, is really helpful because it, it groups verbs together in terms of like the, the grammar of them. Um, so it's important to know that when we use the words argue, claim, comment, conclude and so on, we add the word that and then a thing that is reported. But if we use the verbs like analyze, categorize, characterize, we follow them with a noun. We, we analyze something, we categorize something. These aren't verbs that are used to report like words or statements. Okay, very nearly done. Just about still have a voice. Um, what you can do now is I suggest that you explore that your the, the reading that you do for your subject will show you the verbs that are used in your subject area and i would advise you to try to understand you know try to understand what categories those verbs belong to and then start using them for yourself don't just pick up a a, a, a list of different reporting language and just start using it randomly as i've tried to show you different reporting language has very specific meanings and developing your voice is about like also being you know, precise and and being respectful not just of our reader but of the people that we're referencing so we have to try to get things right we have to choose the the language that's appropriate for our field but also that's expressing exactly what we mean so do look at um a, a task you could do now is look at a, a couple of texts that you've read in the last week go through consider the type of citations that are used are they integral or are they non-integral, what kind of reporting language is used, if any, and then maybe look at the last essay that you wrote and think, okay, was I using that reporting language or was I doing something else? Was I using the same verb all the time, um, even though I needed to express different meanings? Yeah, have a look. The more you think about this and consider it, you'll, you'll, you'll start building into your own writing as well over time. As usual, uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, concerns or feedback, you're very welcome to uh, email me at m.holloway3 at hearts.ac.uk. Thank you very much.